Thomas Alive Today presents... Sylvia Segrist. At Sylvia Segrist's trial her mother Ruth testified that her daughter's paternal grandfather fondled and exposed himself in front of Sylvia when she was 8 years old and that Ruth had not learned about the sexual abuse until Sylvia was 13. When the two discussed the abuse Segrist reportedly told her mother that she didn't know how intimate our relationship was. Segrist was first hospitalized at the age of 16 and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. She was hospitalized a dozen times and upon each discharge psychiatrists diagnosed that she no longer posed a risk to herself or others. When she was of age Segrist attempted to enlist in the US Army. As she was being inducted she faced harassment from other members of her platoon who assumed she was a lesbian. They set her up on a prank date and made her the butt of many jokes thereafter. She idolized mass shooters and she spent a great amount of time at the Springfield Mall harassing other customers and making statements about how good other spree killings were such as the 1984 San Isidro McDonald's massacre committed by James Oliver Huberty. She was discharged from the U.S. Army after two months because of her unusual behavior which included sitting fully dressed in army fatigues at the spa and sauna of her fitness club. An instructor at the fitness club said she hated everyone and would often talk about shooting and killing people. Segrist's behavior was so disconcerting that clerks at a local Kmart told her they had no rifles in stock when she tried to purchase one from them. She eventually purchased the Ruger 1022 at Best Products. On the first of two trips to the Springfield Mall on the day of October 30, 1985, Segrist shopped for Halloween items at a party store. She then worked out at a fitness club before returning to the mall for the last time. Segrist alighted from her vehicle at Datsun B210 retrieved the weapon she had purchased on October 30, 1985. Sylvia Segrist returned to the pharmacy to pick up another prescription. Dressed in her usual green military fatigues, military boots and black beret, she went to the fitness center and quietly worked on the weights. She then proceeded to the library before leaving at 2 p.m. to return to her apartment. After purchasing napkins and a hand towel at a local store, she then returned to the mall at 3.30 p.m. This time however she had a loaded 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle in the trunk of her car. With the rifle in her hands she proceeded towards the mall. While still in the parking lot she spotted a telephone installer leaving the mall to get tools from the truck and open fire. Miraculously she missed and he managed to run for cover. The man who saw the vehicle Segrist had used then flattened one of her tires to prevent her from using it to escape. After spotting a woman at an ATM machine Segrist opened fire again but the woman escaped without injury though half a dozen bullets struck the area around her. Segrist then fired at a group of young children standing in front of a restaurant near the ATM. The young children had been shopping with their mothers at the time of the attack. Two children were seriously injured while a third two-year-old Rasifa Cosman was killed. Segrist then burst into the mall entrance and fired randomly at store employees and customers. She also fired indiscriminately at the store front windows and entrances of nearby stores. Since it was the day before Halloween many customers thought it was a prank and were slow to react. Businesses at the mall had hired entertainers in the past to amuse the customers by dressing up as a cowboy and firing a cap gun. Nobody realized at first that this woman dressed as a commando was shooting people for real. As she proceeded through the mall Segrist fired two shots at a woman near an ice cream stand and hit her both times in the stomach. After shooting two other women she spotted an older man standing in front of a cutlery store window. Then man 67 year old Earl Trout was shot in the face and stomach and later died of his wounds. The people in the mall finally realizing the danger they were in were seeking shelter wherever possible while Segrist continued her rampage. Another man a retired civil servant who had been standing in front of a shoe store with his wife was too slow to seek shelter and was killed by a bullet to the back of the head. He would be the last fatality of the day. As Segrist proceeded back towards the mall entrance 24-year-old John Lawfer approached her in order to put a stop to the shooting. As he would state afterward he was not certain what had been happening and Segrist began firing at him as she had at the others. Miraculously all of the bullets she fired at him missed. 
Laufer angrily pulled the gun out of her hand saying you picked the wrong person to fool with. I'm going to turn you in now. Seagrest seemed stunned at being disarmed and said I'm a woman and I have family problems and I have seizures. Laufer then forced her into a nearby store and waited for mall security to make an arrest. From that point on Sylvia Seagrest seemed quiet and subdued. When asked by mall security why she had attacked the mall she replied my family makes me nervous. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. In total she had killed two people outright another would die later and seriously wounded eight others in a shooting rampage that lasted only four minutes. Except for the actions of John Lawfer that toll would have undoubtedly been much higher. For a year following her rampage Sylvia Segrist underwent an extensive psychiatric evaluation while the court weighed what to do with her. In the meantime her third victim Ernest Trout died in hospital despite heroic efforts to save his life. Trout's death added to the political pressure on prosecutors. After an arraignment hearing during which she swore at the judge and gave a series of bizarre statements including telling the bailiffs just shoot me now the court then appointed psychiatrist James Ewing to conduct a new assessment and she was transferred to the Norristown State Hospital for examination. Based on this new assessment a competency hearing on March 7, 1986 determined that she was fit to stand trial. Her trial began in June that same year and the evidence outlined her long and violent history. That included a choking attempt on her mother the year before as well as an attempted stabbing of a guidance counselor in 1980. Though the counselor had warned at the time that Segrist was too violent to be allowed to be free in the community she only received a brief sentence in a forensic hospital. Segrist had also once thrown a lit match into the face of a psychiatrist set fire to stuffed animals and painted the walls of her apartments with slogans such as I hate you and kill them all. Ruth Segris testified that her daughter had been acting more psychotic than usual in the days before the shooting suggesting that she had gone off her medication. On the morning of the shooting rampage she had asked her daughter to return to the hospital but Sylvia refused saying that she would rather go to prison instead. Although Ruth Segris had investigated having her daughter involuntarily committed she was told by psychiatrists that this would not be possible without a clearly violent incident. Another baffling question was how a woman with obvious mental health problems was able to purchase a .22 caliber semi-automatic rifle. Police learned that she had first tried purchasing one at a local Kmart though store employees managed to persuade her that they didn't have one in stock but they did. It looked like she was ready to go into battle said the store manager in an interview with reporters. Two clerks on that day both felt she was kind of weird. It was more like just a gut feeling. Though she tried ordering the rifle store employees told her that the ATF had turned down her firearms application but they haven't. She then went to a Best Products store and purchased the rifle for $107 after lying on a form that she had no history of mental illness which the store was not legally required to verify her background. To gain experience with shooting a gun she joined the rifle club six months prior to the shooting. While Segrist's public defense attorneys argued that she had been incapable of understanding what she had done the prosecutor William H. Ryan Jr. argued that she had been fully aware of her actions and had carried out her rampage to gain attention. As part of the evidence for the prosecution Ryan pointed out that she had updated her last will and testament with a lawyer the day before the shooting and that she had fully expected to die. On the other hand two psychiatrists and one psychologist retained by the defense testified that she was too mentally ill to understand the full consequences of her actions. After an eight-day trial it only took nine hours for the jury to deliver a verdict of guilty but mentally ill. Sylvia Segrist was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences for one for every fatality with ten years each for the seven additional counts of attempted murder. She was eventually sent to the State Correctional Institution in Muncie, Pennsylvania. A civil action was launched in the following year by the survivors of the shooting and the families of the victims. The Springfield Mall Haverford State Hospital the Township a Mental Health Counselor and the corporation that owned Best Products were all named as defendants on the grounds that they failed to take the needed precautions to protect society. Segrist's actions helped spur the state government to form a legislative task force in order to address better ways to care for the mentally ill in the community. Segrist's mother also urged legislators to make changes to the state mental health laws. 
In response to the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting Segrist's mother Ruth told the Philly Post, You know it's ironic that people who are irrational are expected under the law to get help on their own. There needs to be something in the law that compels a troubled person to be diagnosed by a psychiatrist. In the 1950s we were institutionalizing people who weren't mentally ill. You could institutionalize someone who was just unruly. We've gone from one extreme to the other. Ruth Segrist decades after Sylvia Segrist mentally ill people are still murdering innocents the Philly Post. At the time of the shootings gun buyers were required to sign a paper application declaring they had no record of being in a mental institution. Sylvia Segrist lied on the application and purchased a .22 semi-automatic rifle for $107. In 1998 the state of Pennsylvania enacted the Pennsylvania Instant Check System or PICS enabling licensed gun dealers to conduct a background check using a phone. A reporter from the New York Times sent a letter to Segrist asking her to share her thoughts about what happened at the time of the shooting and about her life before she was arrested. Here is an extract from her response, as I am safer in prison less threatening or perverted lesser crimes than my family, Sylvia W. Segrist's letter NewYorkTimes.com. Sylvia Segrist served her first two one two years of imprisonment at Norristown State Hospital and then transferred to Muncie State Prison for Women. Ruth Segrist and her ex-husband visited Sylvia regularly at Muncie and she seemed to welcome the visits. But about 1992 Sylvia Segrist had severe difficulties with her antipsychotic medication. Her mother is not sure what medication she is taking now but around 1997 Sylvia made a decision to stop any contact with her family members. Visits and phone calls ended the last letter Ruth Segrist sent to her daughter was on November 30. Sylvia has not replied. It's her illness said Ruth Segrist in 2002 she's schizophrenic and psychotic and becomes extremely paranoid. She dwells on things in the past. Since I was her closest family member I got blamed she did what she did because of me. Segrist's Muncie prison counselor meets her at least every two weeks. Her counselor notes that Sylvia takes her meds spends time at the library exercises a lot and takes steps to keep herself sharp. Sylvia Segrist's precursor to the shooting was due to her fear that her mother was trying hard to have her sent to a mental care facility again. She said that she would rather die or go to prison than go to a mental hospital. Ruth Segrist said she had seen a beautiful mind a 2001 biographical drama film about John Nash a Princeton math professor and Nobel laureate who also was schizophrenic. I thought it was very well done Segrist said. When a person is so delusional, at first he thought it all was real but it really was in his mind. Ruth Segrist said I really believe she belongs in the forensic unit of a hospital not in prison she also shared they should be incarcerated in the forensic unit of a hospital until they get functional and stabilized. As for Sylvia Segrist she remains incarcerated. In a 1991 interview with a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer she reported that she has become stabilized due to treatment and medication and remains hopeful that she may be released one day. Every time October 30th rolls around she stated in the interview I have a hard time that day. I have a hard time not crying. The idea that I hurt people. It's hard to describe. As for her reasons for the shooting she blamed it on her violent fantasies and her fear that her mother would have her committed again. She also blamed her rampage on the various side effects of her medication including weight gain and violent fantasies. The newer medication she is taking appear to be doing a better job at controlling her symptoms. Segrist has since gone on to complete a university degree and is actively engaged in teaching mathematics to fellow inmates. While Sylvia Segrist may never be released the legacy of what happened that fateful day in 1985 is still affecting lives decades later. If you have any fond memories please indicate it at the comments below. Thanks for watching, subscribe and like.